the key is to get the place open. And I know that's made me a better design builder for hospitality restaurants. Business of Architecture, episode 271. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture firm. Today is the second half of my conversation with John Sofio, the founder of Built Inc. Built Inc. is a design-focused firm that specializes in hospitality work, specifically nightclubs and hotels. And they don't just design these products, they also build them. They take a very hands-on approach with the buildings that they design, doing things like all the way from the furniture to the fixtures and the furnishings that go into that space. John has designed and built some of Los Angeles' most iconic nightclubs. You can visit builtinc.com to see his projects. Today, you'll hear how John got his start in entrepreneurship, what's inspired him to run and pursue the direction that he's now on, as well as his most important lessons that he's learned about business from running his firm. Now, if you haven't already, be sure to head on over to freearchitectgift.com. Get access to the free four-part architecture firm profit map video that I've prepared specifically for you, a podcast listener. Enter your best email address on that page and you'll get instant access. I want to give a special thanks to the sponsors of today's show, BQE Core and Sage Glass. BQE Core is a firm management software that allows you to manage your firm, your profitability, and your projects all from one beautiful, intuitive dashboard. You can get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com. Sage Glass, our second sponsor today, is the manufacturer of highly intelligent, reliable, dynamic glass that tints automatically to shut out the sun when you don't want it and then let it in when you do. Visit sageglass.com to find out if Sage Glass would be a good choice for your next project. And now, into today's show and conversation with design build firm owner, John Sofio. Well, John, welcome back to the business of architecture. Thank you. Glad to be here. Now, in our break, you shared with me that you guys are in Atlanta now and you're unloading some furniture and fixtures that you brought over from LA. And you talked about actually getting in there, getting your hands dirty, getting sweaty, having to pull out the stuff yourself, you know. So it seems like you take a hands on approach with the business. Yeah. I mean, the client is very uh, hands on himself and um, it it's necessary. You, you can't um, take a back seat and just hope someone's going to do something. Um, we're here setting up the booths and um, there, it, it was kind of a complex uh, puzzle, the way the booths came together. And uh, there was quite a few booths. We have about uh, 70 pieces of uh, furniture in terms of booths. Tomorrow we'll get another um, two truckloads of tables and, and um, FF&E. And you know, at the finish out of these projects, they, we, we have to get our hands dirty. I have to be here. We have to have a team here really um, implementing the design. Um, no drawing would ever show the, uh, the amount of detail that uh, is necessary. And also the, the design is finished out as the artist is there at the end doing it as opposed to a piece of paper and a contractor doing it. Yeah. Now, you definitely, I, I've read, you see yourself as an artist primarily. Uh, looking at your, in your early years, you're very interested in art and kind of went into architecture because of that. I also find it's interesting, John, at the same time with your original goal that you talked about last uh, in last episode, yeah. That you wanted to earn more than four hundred thousand dollars, and your your firm owner at that time said, "Well, good luck to you. You know, well, and that's right. not going to happen here." What what was it in your mindset, your upbringing, or whatever it was yeah. that caused you to merge those two? Because I find that to be uncommon. Hmm. Um, I saw myself as an artist since um, high school, and uh, when I was going to college, I went for English to become a lawyer because our parents wanted us to be, all become lawyers. So I st- stopped after three years and then I lived in New York in, in the city for a couple of years and I was really pursuing my own art. And I got to the point where I w- had to make a decision what I was going to do. And I was concerned about being a starving artist and uh, someone suggested architecture as the highest form of art. So I, I looked into it and I thought, well, through this, business, through this profession, I can create uh, a, a, an artistic um, path for myself. So today, every day, all day long, all we're doing is being creative, hand sketching on, on the door, on the wall, on our hand, on a pad, creating, 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 creating solutions for design. And I think um, I've been blessed because 
I've been so creative since I started my company because I didn't take the tact of just being Joe contractor or just being the architect. We find the, the um, architect, a lot, of our, uh, a lot of the business of architecture is construction documents. We do that in-house because we don't want anyone's um, construction documents dulling down our design. Uh, and it's just one piece of the, the process to get the design done, especially in these hospitality projects. You know, the building department really doesn't care what the booth looks like, what, how, how the booth is, you know, connected, what, how strong it is, what the fabrics are, and, and all of those things are, are the creative side of it. So, Yeah, they just want to make sure, you know, you're, you have your P-traps in and, yeah. your, and, and, right, and we got your all, flow calcs for your plumbing fixtures. And the ADA and, 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 and yeah. we have dialed in and, and we respect that and uh, <laughs> it's part of it but it's not everything and, and you know the artistic part of it is creating as you're building for us and when when you're when you're approaching a new contract with a new client um how does the conversation come up hey by the way we're going to design this but we're also going to build this so do they already expect to know that you guys are integrated I, now they they know that we're uh, fully integrated from uh, top to bottom and uh i think even if we're not the licensed contractor or the contract contractor um, where we are running the contractors and that, that's what we're doing in Atlanta. We are running the process, the project, and um, we take the design build um, method, even if we're not being the, the official contractor. So we develop a budget. We talk to the, con the contractor on site and tell them this is the budget we're using for these things. And if you disagree with it, let us know. And, you know, we could bring in other contractors for certain trades that you don't want to handle. Um, so, for instance, the bringing in three hundred thousand dollars worth of FF and E to Atlanta, um, I could have easily just drawn the drawings and had the client or the contractor hire a local booth fabricator, table ma manufacturer. But you know, we there's two things. One, I'm training then another booth guy on how to actually do it versus how they do it, and um, all of those small details I can't be on site to really dial in or in their shop. So we contain, we maintain the control if we ship the stuff that we fabricated. And, uh, it's just a faster, simpler way to go if we execute our own work, even if there's a contractor there, meaning we're bringing all the FF&E &E and the last layer of, of the decor, um, or we're providing materials for the contractor. So we're not getting, uh, uh, samples back to us that we sent to them. It's, it's like we don't need the back and forth. We'll just purchase all of the finishes and have it shipped to the site and then they can install. And who builds your stuff back in LA? So I'm the general contractor in LA and in, in, in our California project. So I build my work. Uh, yeah. I don't physically do the work, but I have superintendents, I have project managers, and I've um, basically have developed a, I wouldn't say a team of people because it's bigger than that. It's um, relationships with other smaller generals or smaller uh, subcontractors. And, you know, I'll have five or six different electricians, same. Same thing with plumbers. Uh, we have four shops that fabricate our um, FF&E side. Um, we have our own wood shop, and uh, uh, we are the general. I'm the general contractor on those projects. Yeah, awesome. In terms of getting the FF&Es done, do you find that it's you end, end up farming out that to those four preferred uh, builders, the cabinet shops or whatever you're using, or are you doing a lot of that stuff in your own wood shop? Uh, most of the mill work we're doing in our own wood shop. And then on the uh, uh, booths, we have three uh, booth fabricators that, uh, you know, that if you just gave them the drawings, they'll give you back something very pedestrian. Uh, so we require them to create a four foot uh, prototype. Then we design and edit all of the detailing. So they're very much in house uh, on our projects. And with the volume of work that we're doing, we pretty much absorb most of their uh, bandwidth. Awesome. Now, how do you structure your fees in terms of that extra contract administration or construction management or design build part of the thing? How do you guys structure that? For instance, in Atlanta, if they're doing the building, right. what does the fee look like there? So we have uh, negotiated a fixed fee for our design services for the three spaces. Um, and then the providing the FF&E where we'll develop a budget for uh, say all of the booths, the budget is X and, um, the client approves the X as opposed to having someone else bid it or, or build it. Um, in Dallas, we just issued the, um, the drawings for the booths and they're having some, their booth guy give us, uh, give them a price. Now, the fear is that their booth guy will give them a great price, but it's going to be the 
pedestrian kind of diner style booth. So um, to, to the extent that we could convince the client that, you know, if his price is the same as our price, let us do it. So we don't have to fly back and forth to Dallas to go look at, you know, this guy's work as he's producing it. Cause once it's done, it's hard to get them to redo it. It's hard to tell the client, Oh, don't accept that. You know, we have like, we just, we, I understand the business that, that I'm in and uh, the clients need to get their spaces open. And if it means the design got flattened out in Chicago, so be it. Let's just keep pushing and see what else we could do better at, from that point, uh, as opposed to causing the triangle between owner, designer, and contractor, and who's wrong, who's right, and you know, just getting into these arguments. Um, their goal really is to get the place open. And that's actually what I like most about doing this hospitality work is that the main goal is to get it open. It's not an emotional you know, um, journey for them in, in, in a residential project. Yeah. So, John, I was reading that your parents were, they were business owners as well. Is that the case? Yeah, the small business owners. I grew up in an Italian deli in uh, Long Island. Um, I grew up at the age of seven when they bought the deli, you know, mopping the floors and making pasta. And our parents pushed five of us to go to college. And the, the typical story, you know, uh, the, American, the American dream, go to college and become a lawyer. So out of five of us, one of us has become a lawyer and he hates it. So he's become now an NFL agent. Um, uh, a couple of the other siblings got locked into union jobs and um, I kind of uh, just fought, fought all of those uh, uh, things off. And uh, I, I know when I decided to go to school for architecture, I didn't know where I would land, where I am now. But I think every opportunity I had, I took in terms of being creative. Matter of fact, that first house that I was describing that I did, um, this small house that was uh, a remodel, my dad came to the project and uh, he was like, man, you're doing too much here for them. You're doing too much. Just wrap this up, wrap this up. And I was like, well, no, you know, it's my, my, it's my only opportunity. It's my first opportunity to do something substantial. And uh, while we didn't make really any money on the project, we definitely made money off of the project um, from the LA Times article. And then we got another article. And uh, we got those articles without a PR firm back back in the day. We, we um our work was just speaking for itself. And um, now with the volume of openings that we do, we, we, we have the PR firm, um, you know, just making sure that everything is taken care of as these places open. Yep. What, what lessons, how did that early, seeing your parents as business owners, seeing their struggles and, yeah. and you working in that shop, how has that informed your approach to business? So it's given me the uh, work ethic that uh, I know has helped my success, um, you know, getting up at, we have an opening one night, we're out till two, three, four in the morning. The next day we have an, an inspection. I'm there at six in the morning, regardless of what we did the night before. Um, the hard work ethic, I think, is what ingra was ingrained in me. Um, them pushing us out of the food business, uh, I think they could have probably have kept us in the food business and propagated the food business as a family business much, much bigger than it was, than uh, where it landed. And, uh, you know, now, you know, I'm building restaurants, uh, um, have all of this internal knowledge of the food business. Um, we had restaurants in Queens and on uh, Queens Boulevard. And I have this knowledge that I didn't even, you know, knew, knew, knew I had, so to speak, because I grew up kind of in that business. Um, but I think the, the main thing was like they were pushing us out of uh, the small business entrepreneur and it was, they actually ingrained it in me. Okay. Uh, I, I read online that you, uh, have interest in uh, cafe Cito organico. Is that, tell me about that. So it's a, uh, espresso, uh, bar that we have in Silver Lake. We also have a roasting plant in uh, Glassell park and we're private labeling, um, coffee for other, um, actually other friends that are developing brands. Um, my friend Angel was the uh, owner of Cavacito, and over the years, I was given a business advice, and then he and his partner, Mitch, asked me to come in and look at a project that they wanted to expand, Cavacito, and so I told them a budget that it would take to do it, and they gave me a $5,000 check, and they were like, okay, this is great. Let's get going, and about 10 minutes later after I left, they called back, and they were like, ah, oh, could we have one more conversation? I was like, I circled back, came back, they were like, actually, we don't have any money. Could you be our partner? <laughs> I was like, oh, God. Okay. So. Um, We've, we've had uh, uh, places, uh, sorry, um, retail spaces in, um, in uh, Malibu for about six, seven years. 
Uh, we just closed that up because we're focusing more on our private label. Uh, so Cafecito Organico is really focused on buying coffee um, in a sustainable way from farmers down in uh, Central America. Angel goes down there once a year. I've went on a few trips down there for coffee buying. I'm focused on the branding side of of the co of our company and and on the development side. So we rebranded uh, the logo and the look and. Um, Branding's been a big thing for me over the years, and Cafecito is one of our brands. Yeah. And how do you manage the time split? between A design build firm takes a lot of energy to work, yeah. I know. How so do you manage I, that I plus another business? I'm a silent business? partner, but I don't run the business and I don't operate the business. So my two partners do that side of it, and I do more of the development side. Great. So when you say development side, you're referring to what? So like... Uh, I developed a brand called Mason and Mason. It's part of the Found Hotel project, and it's a coffee. Um, it's going to be a coffee shop within the hotel, and then that uh, coffee will also be. So we're roasting the coffee. We did the logo for the coffee. Came up with the name for the coffee, and um, we're developing drinks for that brand. Um, I've also developed other private label brands with other people that are in the that we're in the mix on now. So at first, I tried to separate the two businesses. I didn't want to. Um, intermingle the Cavacito side from the design build side. Uh, but over the years, as we've developed such deep relationships with our clients and they were doing coffee, um, I started uh, kind of letting those two mingle and, and so it's working out really well now. Gotcha. What would you say would be the biggest lessons, John, that you've learned from being a business owner? So I, um, one of my uh, biggest lessons that I've learned in business was when I went out to Palm Springs with a client. I did a few restaurants for him and uh, he showed me this project and I said to myself, wow, I would love to be an owner in this project. So um, he turned to me and he said, oh, would you like to do this as a partnership? And I was like, oh, absolutely. And we had some funds that were available to, to invest. Um, and after you know 19 months of hard work and chasing the the approvals on the project, we realized that the client was um, not uh, an upfront uh, guy, and he was, you know, stealing the money, not you spending the money that we were giving him to to get the project going. So it kind of tapped us, uh, tapped me financially, and um, I was pursuing opening my own business as a restaurateur. Uh, I got back to LA, and I hit LA really hard to kind of get back up, and that lesson of getting basically being broke as a someone who's trying to open their own restaurant is giving me a different perspective on um, uh, on my client's view. So now I attack the projects as if I'm the owner and I need to get them open no matter what, whether the money's there, whether they spend, whether they have cash flow or not, whether they have to pay me later, uh, the key is to get the place open. And I know that's made me a better design builder for hospitality and restaurants. Awesome. Well, John, if people like to find out more about you, follow you, are you on any social media channels? How can they keep up with what you're doing? Yeah, we're, we're under builtink.com. I'm sorry, builtink.com is our website. Uh, Built underscore Inc. is our uh, Instagram page. And uh, John Sofio is my Instagram page. And that's basically what we're under. Okay. So John Sofio is the founder of Built Inc. John, thanks for being honest with us, uh, being on with us and sharing your <laughs> entrepreneurial journey. Awesome. And being honest with us. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you for having me. Hey, John. Take care. Awesome. And that is a wrap. To discover how to create a firm with less fires and more fun, I've prepared a special 60-minute presentation that you can get instant access to as a podcast subscriber by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar. During that training, you'll discover the three things, three perhaps the three most important things you can do to create your perfect firm your perfect job, and your perfect client. To discover how to market your firm, to bring in and attract the kind of clients that you would like to work with, the creative projects that really get you excited, go view my 60-minute marketing training at architectwebinar.com. On that page, you can sign up for free. You'll be able to watch that from the comfort of your home or your office. A big thanks to today's podcast sponsors, BQE Core and Sage Glass. BQE Core is a firm management software that allows you to manage your firm, your finances, the finances of your firm, your projects, all from an easy to use mobile dashboard that's available on a mobile device or on your desktop computer, all from the cloud. Find out more and get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. Sage Glass 
manufactures a special kind of glass that tints automatically to optimize daylight, reduce glare, and manage heat in your pro projects, all while maintaining unobstructed views to the outdoors. You can create better, more sustainable spaces for people to learn, create, and work. Visit sageglass.com to find out if it'd be a good fit for your next project. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.